so thanks for coming um, on this very hot evening and um, not staying at home in a bath full of ice. Um, you did great to get here at all. Um, thank you to our panelists for being here. We have um, Hermi Zanuzel, Katarzyna Davidova, Magdalena Szybka, Peter Dobrowski, and Tomas, uh, Tomas Frank Franke. Oh, my best German accent, sorry. And our moderator is uh, Jan Koshala, who is the actual coordinator of the Green New Deal for Europe in the Czech Republic. So um, I'm from DM Praha, so it's us who organized the event tonight. Um, DM, you might know, is the Democracy in Europe Movement 2025. Um, it's a grassroots movement all over Europe, and we're the local Prague branch of it. So um, we're putting on this event tonight. Um, so we obviously support the Green New Deal for Europe, which is a coalition with lots of other partners. But we also support Julian Assange. Um, so you might have seen the little box at the back. You can write a letter or a note of support to Julian Assange if you feel so inclined. Um, and you can leave that in the box and we're going to post those to him then at the end of the night um, to uh, where he's in prison in the UK. Um, uh, yes, uh, Michaela Turkikova Vojtkova couldn't be here tonight, unfortunately. She's from Zelena Revize, the left wing of the Green Party. She couldn't make it because her baby is sick, but, um, which is unfortunate. Um, and I think that's all I wanted to say. That's, uh, oh yeah, we're going to watch the movie. So yes. We're just going to play a short film, a three minute film, just to give everyone a little idea of the Green New Deal. Um, it was made in May, and the Green New Deal for Europe is a kind of a framework that has changed a little bit since May, so the information is very slightly out of date, but um, it's an animated film, so it's good to just kind of give you an idea of what it's about. Um, so we'll play that now. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change states we have 12 years to limit climate catastrophe. 12 years to cut most of our emissions. In Europe, there's fortunately a broad agreement that a green transition would boost our economy. But reluctant governments and our undemocratic establishment in Brussels are favoring big business tax cuts, letting the few hoard the profits, while imposing austerity on the many, creating job insecurity and Europe's lowest investment to savings ratio since World War II. We say there's an alternative, but it can only be realized if we stand together across the continent. It's time to listen to the people's demands and create a new green investment plan in favor of workers and our environment. We propose a Green New Deal for Europe. Its main objective? To spend 500 billion euros annually to fund the green transition we need and boost the economy of Europe's working and middle classes. And this is how we'll fund it. The European Investment Bank is going to issue bonds. The bonds are bought by investors and the public. The money is used to fund green development projects and the profits are distributed among bondholders. The European Investment Bank issues bonds all the time. But this time, it will issue bonds to the tune of 500 billion euros every year, for five years, conducting the green transition in energy, transport and agriculture, and secure a massive increase of unionized jobs across the whole continent. This is all possible within the existing EU framework and doesn't need any new law or treaty to be created. In fact, after many weeks of climate strikes in Brussels, the EU Commission President Jean-Claude Juncker promised that in coming years, billions of the EU budget would go to fighting climate change. That's a start, but not nearly enough. We need a truly transformative plan, which secures workers' rights and is paid by secure investment and the EU institutions that are supposed to work for us, not by further taxation of the people. That is why we, in collaboration with the progressives across the continent, have created the European Spring, Europe's first transnational party, to run in upcoming EU Parliament elections and implement this program. The European elections will happen between Thursday 23rd of May and Sunday 26th of May. Go to europeanelections.eu to find out your country's procedures and dates. We are at a crucial moment in European history. At the same time as faith in the EU is waning, we see a rise in misanthropy, xenophobia and toxic nationalism. That is why we have come together 
despite our diverse political traditions, green, radical left, liberal, to work to make the EU a realm of shared prosperity, peace and solidarity for all green. Europeans, and to make sure our continent is taking its part to create the future we want for our world. Green. Read the rest of our program at europeanspring.net. Okay, I will stand up for the first moment that you see at least because I'm sitting so low that I can't even see you. So one more time, my name is Jan Kosciak. I'm coordinator for the Green New Deal for Czech Republic. Uh, I'm a member of Social Democracy. I was uh, MEP candidate. Of course, we lost, but I think because we lost, we we lost because of the not supporting enough a Green New Deal and the Green Transition. So that's kind of the reason why I'm here. I would start with the short presentation what is actually the organization behind and then I would give a short time, few minutes for each panelist of presenting themselves, maybe saying what they support and what they do right now and then we would have a, a discussion on Green New Deal, on the program and on the whole scale. In any moment, if you have a question or anything, just raise the hand or just stand up or just come in and uh, ask or say what you think, what you see, or what you feel. And do, feel free to join us in front. And one more thing, I almost forget, we all forget. I have bring some food. So if you, have, if you are hungry at any time, just, just take whatever you think, whatever you want. Uh, I will sit. So green wood, I feel. Can you hear me well? Yes. Because oh, okay. I, I can't hear myself well, but okay. Uh, Green New Deal. Uh, it's kind of a young organization. It becomes really active after the, the elections because maybe you know uh, DM was not very successful in the European elections. And we have some members, but really few of them. So we, we established a new organization, Green New Deal which we thought it might be better to have it uh, a little bit not that political. Because our idea was having the umbrella organization which would put together all the movements and all the green, think, green thinking people and politicians or anybody who's going to support our program or our ideas and put something in power and put all these people together. So. Of course, we become from DM, so our main, let's say, supporter or cooperation is with DM. But our idea is to cooperate with also other parties, including Greens, including Socialists, or any kind of movements which would like, or we would like to cooperate, or actually change, change the world. I would say to change the world. I think it's uh, it's enough because. The program behind the Green New Deal is really ambitious. We say that it's the biggest transformation in our history, at least in our lives. And I feel that it is like that, so I believe that we can change it, but we have to do it all together. So I would give a space to our speakers right now, to our panelists. Feel free to say whatever you want and then we can start the discussion on Green New Deal. I will start with, uh, from the, your left, with Remy. Hi, so I'm Remy Anderson, and I'm here to represent Limitis Memi, which is a Czech movement fighting uh, against the uh, coal industry to uh, push for a uh, phase out of coal as soon as possible. Um, we are doing it through civil disobedience, so it's a non-violent movement, and we are engaged uh, into blockading mines and demands to have uh, a phase out of call as soon as possible. Um, so we have, you might have heard also about Endegrende in Germany, which this weekend was blockading the biggest mine in Europe, which is uh, near uh, Humpback Forest. Uh, so it was this weekend more than 6,000 uh, people in Germany from all over Europe blockading the mine, going into the mine and into the train tracks to blockade coal industry. 
And now in the Republic, starting tomorrow, for nine days, there will be a Prima Camp, which is uh, the action in the Czech Republic, uh, when we will organize workshops about uh, climate change, about uh, mobilization, um, about all the issues that we have to face uh, because of um, climate warming. And uh, it starts yeah, tomorrow, and we will have an action against uh, power plant in Kvalitice. Uh, uh, which is a coal power plant which is uh, really problematic uh, and not respecting even uh, the low criteria uh, of pollution that are set. Yeah. And um, yeah, I think it's nothing. Thank you. Uh, my name is Katarzyna Davidova. I'm representing an NGO called Center for Transport and Energy, which is also part of a larger group of NGOs called CEE Bankwatch Networks, um, which is quite a unique network because it combines NGOs uh, throughout Central and Eastern Europe that work on environmental impacts of um, public investments and sort of trying to keep the public uh, finance bodies in check. Um, but as part of the Center for Transport and Energy, we right now cover three topics mostly. Um, one of them is just transition away from coal. So we work a lot with the Czech coal mining regions, especially in, in the north, the lignite regions of Ustetsky Kraj and Karolvarsky Kraj, and also with the governmental program Restart, which is aimed at the structural transformation of these regions. Um, another topic or area that we cover is um, EU climate legislation and how it's transposed into the Czech Republic. So that's mostly advocacy work. Um, we've been working on the Czech National Energy and Climate Plan. Um, we often try and increase ambition of, of the Czech legislation or um, we try to make basically the Czech Republic comply with the EU norms and standards a bit more. Um, recently, for example, when uh, Andrei Babish went to the European Council to debate the net zero target by 2050, we made a group of um, other uh, environmental NGOs under the umbrella of the Czech Climate Coalition and we wrote um, some letters to, to the Prime Minister urging him to support the target, which unfortunately he did not in the end, but it's, it's a long work. And the last topic that we cover is export credit agencies, which is not a well-known topic and it's not so exciting, but basically um, each, each state, each government has some export credit agencies. Here it is the Czech Export Bank um, and they are financing our exports and we want the public money that goes through these um, institutions not to be spent on fossil fuel projects or other environmentally harmful projects that would uh, lead to increase of emissions, not in the Czech Republic, but elsewhere in, in the world. Um, yeah, I think that's all from me. Hi, my name is Magdalena Šipka. I'm a member of a Christian feminist collective and I am Dalton and I focus on the theology of nature. So, for example, I'm mostly um, doing Hedegra von Bingen and also the Pope Francis Laudato Si. Yes, and I'm poet and a publicist. Yeah, and I think that's all. Good, good evening, I'm Petr Dubravsky and I'm so sorry. And, uh, <laughs> and I'm part of uh, Fridays for Future. Uh, I think you uh, heard about Fridays for Future. It's an organization of uh, high school students that are striking for climate so on Fridays. Yeah, and we are calling for, uh, we are calling politicians to act and uh, yeah to care about uh, both climate and we justify. Uh, and we demand the justified solution of the uh, climate crisis. Um, my name is Thomas Franke, I'm here for Extinction Rebellion. 
Extinction Rebellion burst onto the scene uh, at the end of uh, last October in uh, Britain, and uh, Extinction Rebellion has uh, three core demands. Uh, we want uh, the governments to declare a climate emergency in order to actually inform the public on uh, the dire situation we find ourselves in. I think the IPCC uh, prognosis is uh, actually uh, over-optimistic. Um, we, the second demand is uh, uh, to cut uh, um, emissions, uh, CO2 emissions by uh, 2025 to net zero in uh, the developed world and uh, uh, the third demand is uh, to um, to get the, the actual implementation of policies to do that uh, via a citizen assembly which is a, um, yeah, a political tool uh, uh, probably to uh, yeah uh, so uh, our tactics is uh, mass uh, civil disobedience. Uh, so far, uh, we have been, in my view, phenomenally uh, successful. We, uh, uh, after after 11 days of uh, blocking just four sites in London, for instance, uh, the, the British Parliament uh, uh, declared a climate emergency for Britain. Uh, the Br uh, British government is now uh, actively going for our third demand uh, to establish a citizens assembly in, in Britain and here in the Czech Republic we started a serious work in, uh, in January along the same lines of organizing as uh, other people do in other parts of the world especially in Britain and uh, we, uh, we went for the lower hanging fruit of putting pressure on the uh, on Prague Town Hall and again I think uh, for the small numbers we still have of about a hundred uh, active uh, members now. Uh, we have been phenomenally uh, successful with uh, Prague 6 and 7 declaring climate uh, emergencies and uh, Prague Town Hall declaring a climate, uh, what's it called? Climate, uh, well, <laughs> they thought of a different title, just uh, to, not to be, not to alarm, to, to alarm the, the public. Uh, so, uh, and we, uh, we want to, we are taking part in the cli cli uh, Klima Camp and uh, of course we have been in close cooperation with other organizations, uh, the, uh, the Fridays for Future has been um, regularly supporting us uh, in, on the action in, at uh, Town Hall and uh, uh, we want to go for a major uh, action with mass civil disobedience by uh, October of this year uh, in Prague. Thank you. Well, I see we have a really wide panelist, which is great for us. Um, first, I have to mention that uh, uh, we as a Green New Deal, we were last Friday in Aachen on Fridays for Future protest. We had a speech there and we present ourselves and we establish, uh, let's say, a part of the cooperation with Fridays for Future in Aachen. So I hope we can join their protests again and we can even support them here in Czech Republic. And also we were in, uh, I'm not sure about my German, in Gedilenge, in Gedilenge event. Uh, we, well, let's say I have spent the uh, last uh, Saturday in a uh, brown cold mind in this weather protesting and trying to, to close the, the coal mines and stop uh, the power plants. So, that were the activities of Green New Deal for last weekend. Okay. But in general, we believe that the system is actually, is actually broken. That the system which we are living right now is broken. And we agree on this actually with Fridays for Future because we believe that the politicians are not doing enough. They didn't know about the problem about maybe 40, almost 50 years, and they are still speaking, but they are not doing enough. So actually our first pillar is uh, called that we have to meet the scale, the real scale of the problem, the real scale of the, I would call it a climate crisis, not just the warming or change, but the crisis. 
So I would like to ask the panelists, maybe, uh, what's supposed to be the scale of the change? Is it enough that we start with ourselves, in our lives, in our homes, or it's not enough? Should we push the local governments, the state governments, or European, or worldwide? What do you think? What's supposed to be the scale of the change for the future? Who would like to start? No? Okay. Yeah, extension. Okay, I feel chatty. Uh, I just read uh, The uh, Economist uh, and uh, it's uh, quite, uh, quite interesting to see that The Economist agrees that uh, uh, the, the market is not enough uh, to actually uh, do a, a green transformation to uh, avert the major catastrophe that's uh, in the wings. And uh, they also uh, agree that uh, the main uh, the main focus is the political system. That all the other actions that we have tried over the last 30 years have not uh, borne fruit. So I think uh, that's uh, we can't we, we can't we can't any longer uh, lose our time discussing about how to best recycle. It's just a blind alley. I think that. Uh, if we want to solve climate crisis, we we have to change everything. We need to change the way of we are thinking. We uh, need to change how uh, our economy works, and uh, we need to change the whole system uh, in uh, in which we are living. And uh, I will love the question or or to know that uh, everyone should uh, should start from. Uh, himself, because yeah, start for, from yourself and do the best for uh, for solving the climate, for, for climate change. And uh, of course, it's important to uh, to like uh, do what is uh, in your possibility. But uh, and I I mean the way of uh, of our uh, yeah of, of what we are buying and of our our like personal consumption. Uh, but I'm not, uh, for example, I'm vegetarian, but I'm not vegetarian because uh, I think it's, uh, it's uh, going to solve climate crisis and I just want to show that, uh, that pe people can live in different, uh, in different way and in different system. And that uh, the changes we are going for are not uh, going to be bad for us. I think we should work together and stop to feel guilt that we really often just point to someone and say you don't recipe enough, you uh, eat uh, bad food and these things and I think it, this criticization must stop and we have to start work together and support each other in each of ways we can help to uh, change this system and to change the, the way we uh, yeah, we react on on nature. So uh, let's stop with guilt and stop with criticizing the small acts. Okay. Um, I agree with my predecessors here that the change needs to be widespread and it needs to come from the governments, not from individuals. That's not to say that we shouldn't try because the individuals are those that influence what the government will do so it's sort of interconnected but without a major change in how the government see the climate crisis we are not going to move forward and I would say that it's it's a question of priorities really because we have the, the resources um, we, we have the finances uh, we have Lots of technologies that, if deployed properly, we can make a big change, but the political priorities are not there. Um, so we need to align all the priorities, make climate crisis the really top priority, and then everything else needs to follow. Um, the state budget, investment into everything, it, it shouldn't be contradicting our effort to combat climate change, climate crisis. And once these priorities are set straight, um, I believe that, yeah, the change is possible. So it's going to be hard to not repeat what has been done. So what I would like to add is more that 
Like we are um, often saying in uh, climate justice movement, uh, system change and not climate change. But when we have said that, we have not said that much because what is the system? What is the scale of the system? So I really think, yeah, we we have an emergency. So everything we can do, we should do it. And we try, if we can, to uh, push our agenda in uh, some local level, then do it. If you can do it in the um, um, government, do it. If you can do it personally, do it. And uh, it's important to build alternatives. Because if we are asking for something, we should be able to prove that we can do something differently. So we need people who are just doing their things and saying, see, we can live in a different way. We can have this kind of other system. But we also need people which are going to blockade this current system to force the change. Because if we are just asking massively to people who have interest to keep the system the way it is, no, nothing will happen. So we also need that. We also need people which are ready to just say, no, enough is enough. We have an emergency and we will stop it until we met um, what we have to do to limit that, the climate change. Okay, thank you. Do we have any questions on this topic? And feel free even ask in Czech or other languages you are for sure will translate. No questions right now? Okay. I have a question. Okay, great. Okay, I said without mic. Okay. okay. So we are please. I have a question to Thomas and Kat. Um, <laughs> you were talking about uh, getting like your success as getting certain parts of Prague to declare the uh, climate um, Emergency, if I understand correctly. What does it translate to? I mean, what kind of action does it translate to? I mean, that's my question. <laughs> okay, thanks. Uh, yeah, just open the door, really. Uh, it's, uh, of course, a declaration, and then there are further steps, and uh, it's just opening a door, but also opening a door for us to put further pressure on the uh, on these councils, uh, and uh, we have actually been surprised uh, positively. For instance, in Prague 7, uh, they uh, started off with uh, yeah, uh, a few trees and stuff, but then they moved on to further issues like uh, renewable energy. So, uh, so I think they are moving in, in the right direction. I, I, of course, I, I feel that climate emergency is uh, very important for us. It's something that uh, politicians, uh, that politicians care. But still, I still it, uh, it doesn't mean that uh, that we won. It means that we still need to, uh, yeah, we we still need to watch them and uh, we still need to uh, to push them to make the changes. For example, when uh, yeah, yeah, for example, the plan. Like like a difference between uh, between the plan of, uh, of Prague City Hall before and uh, after the protest, it just uh, it just five percent of uh, of uh, CO two emissions and it's quite uh, ridiculous. So uh, yeah, I think in this fight we uh, we need to be aware of, uh, of populism and of uh, of marketing because even though we have now uh, quite uh, or like not so bad government in Prague. There are still there are still political parties, and there are still uh, yeah like they, they still want to somehow sell uh, uh, somehow sell their, their politics, and they are still doing doing like marketing to uh, attract the voters. Yeah, if I can, like, sorry, thank you for the answer. I'm, I mean natural that if we have to keep watching politicians, but my question is also like, because the word uh, emergency, for me, means something really serious. When we talk about, you know, state of emergency, like in case of war, for example, so there are procedures, people do something, and I, I would imagine that there should be certain procedures, or like they, they would come up with a special policy, right? I mean, it's very nice to start planting more trees, uh, but, you know, I feel that if there's not no policy, the word is going to lose its meaning, and then people will just be, you know, like more and more, maybe, you know, uh, reluctant to do anything. Oh yeah, climate emergency, okay, just another one. You know what I mean? So, uh, how to actually translate it to a particular policy that, that would actually state what they are, you know, obliged to do? Well, I, I can comment on this because. 
Well, yesterday I spent half a day with some politicians from Prague 7, and what we agree is that to call a climate crisis in any kind of city or even country level is just the beginning. It's just the first step. It's like a political act that, yes, we know it's a problem, and we are going to work on this. So I, as we agree yesterday, at least in, from people from Prague 7, is that it's just the beginning. Of course it's political act, of course it's kind of populism, but at least it calls attention, because at least in Czech Republic nobody knows what does it mean. And I mean the work is on them. They have to now organize meetings, they have to show the policy, they have to show the program and they have to act, of course. And we have to, we as a citizens, we have to push them. But yes, yeah, we agree, we saw it, it's a first step. First step of the whole journey of how to transform. Uh, okay. uh, last week, Justin Trudeau uh, announced a climate crisis uh, for Canada, and then the next day he uh, approved uh, further oil pipeline construction and extensions. So it seems to me that uh, for a number of politicians, declaring a climate crisis is simply a public relations opportunity, and uh, then they can just go on with business as usual. And you're absolutely right. I mean, uh, Justin Trudeau is from my sister party, and I feel shame about that because, yeah, to say something and do the opposite, it's uh, it's not acceptable. And uh, he's criticized, but I'm afraid that that's the part of the system which we are living in. That uh, we say something, but we kind of do the opposite, because in Europe is similar situation and it was many times and that's why we think that the scale has to be much bigger the scale of the change and it can't be just the, the new party will come the new program even if the greens will win now in germany i mean i would support them of course and i like their program but i think we still have to cooperate all together and try to change the system because like that the power of the business is maybe too big for us and if you have any comment Mm, just yeah, just a comment because I think we all see that something's changing now with uh, the rise in, in the protests and strikes and um, even at Letna with the quarter of a million people, climate change was mentioned as one of the problems of our today's government. So that is great and we should embrace it. But on the other hand, as you already hinted at, we have to make sure that it's followed by action um, because if it's not, then lots of the people will feel either disillusioned or there will just be a backlash against um, this upheaval that has now appeared, unless it's followed by concrete action and people will see that, yeah, there are policies put in place, it's not just a public relations exercise. And I, I think it's also on us to make sure that the politicians who are now proclaiming to do something about climate, that they will actually do it. Yeah, and also I think it's a better outcome, him declaring a climate emergency and then standing up and, and uh, signing a deal. So it's, I think uh, there must have been tens of millions of Canadians actually seeing through this hypocrisy. So it's a better outcome than him just signing the deal. So I think that uh, opens the door for people to be enraged about this hypocrisy and actually do something about it. I agree. Uh, I would say the last question on the topic and then we will move on. You want a microphone? No, I just... What I would be watching for is some changes in, in the budget because before they start shifting money between different chapters of the budget and, and invest in, in, in real policies, then I think it's one other thing. Yeah, I agree and I have to comment that because the Green New Deal for Europe, we are trying to push actually now the MEPs, which will also vote on this, to have a 5% of the budget uh, having just, just for the climate change, just for the investment, just for the transition. I know that 5% sounds not maybe enough, but it's still a bit much more than probably on any so other... 5% of GDP, because... We already have more than 5% of the budget on climate and Juncker is suggesting 25% of the next budget. 
mean, the 5% is it, It's a GDP, yeah, yeah, you're right. Okay, um, I just recommend because you mentioned it that we have to move and we have to act. And uh, last Friday, I saw, a, let's say, a hope. A hope for that because I saw 40,000 young people, but not only young, actually, there were also some older people, but mostly young people screening to end of this system, screening to the end, to the end of the capitalism and calling for the green transition. And I think it's still growing. So I kind of, for me at least, was that was a big move and uh, the hope for the future. But of course we have to work all together, I think. Well, I will move on. Uh, one of the pillars of the Green New Deal is actually to kind of challenge the idea of endless growth and endless consumption because we right now we live in the society of growth and consumption and mass production probably heard that 40% of the food is throwing away and there are much more numbers which we could mention right now but yeah the Green New Deal and one of the pillars is to, uh, to really challenge this and to try to change the economical system not really comparing every single country about the economical growth but stop this endless growth but really try to feel and work with people and the societies and what we say that we don't want the economical growth but we want the human growth and we want that the families, societies and people have enough for living have a better standards of, of living and of course have a decent jobs so that's the part of it and I would like to ask if you can comment on idea of endless growth or consumption and how maybe we can change it any volunteer right now? yeah here is written that we can grow in happiness and we can uh, grow in our human dignity. I think it's much better than growing in GDPR and I think this endless growth is actually destroying us and that um, reconnecting with uh, some sustainable measures on reconnecting with uh, nature could be really good and that capitalism which made more and more things and uh, make us work more and more is actually unhealthy for us. So I think that uh, this change could be a really good change, a really good opportunity for restore some human dignity and actually heal uh, not just planet but also each human. Uh, but it's this utopic vision. Yeah. Anyone else? Yeah, I mean, it's a huge question and for, for many years already we've been discussing that um, GDP is not the right way to, to measure um, well-being or, or progress of countries, especially well-being, I would say. Um, but so far there isn't any viable alternative that I know of, which doesn't mean that there can't be. Um, Unfortunately, I haven't read much about it, but for example, the Donut Economics by Kate Raworth, um, I think that could be an interesting alternative, but if there are some speakers here who are more knowledgeable about it, I would gladly leave you the, the word. But um, I think that one problem is that in the world where, where corporations and, and business has so much power, it's going to be hard to push for anything um, that just doesn't easily measure some sort of performance for the shareholders because that's what motivates the companies to, to create more and more growth because the shareholders want it um, and because uh, yeah basically if, if this system is kept there is not much room for change but for example if we look at companies um, that don't value shareholders so much, but they value stakeholders, which is a bit different. Um, it's, for example, their employees, um, people who are dependent on the companies for their living and so on. They just don't want the shares and then sell them off when the company is doing poorly, but they want the company to prosper in the long term. 
then maybe we can also look at other measures of, of good performance which don't only relate to the numbers of quarterly growth or uh, annual growth, which I think is, is one of the biggest problems of, of this sort of um, GDP calculation. And um, so, as part of a movement which works on consensus, I won't be able to like give a, an opinion on all the movements on this because uh, we don't have uh, discussed and reached consensus on everything that should, we should be doing after that. But what we can have on consensus is that obviously uh, growth, infinite growth is not going to be possible. Um, we are in a limited planet and we also have, because of climate change, uh, to phase out of fossil fuel. And um, now, right now, 75% of the energy in the world is based on fossil fuel. Mm. So let's be honest, if we have to phase out of that as soon as possible, it means we will have to learn how to uh, spend way less energy than now. Mm. Especially if we are also uh, fighting for climate justice, meaning that we want that people which have are uh, living with far less standard of living that we are doing here, they will have them to spend more energy than we do here. So we will have to accept that we can't progress and we can't produce more and more. We have to learn how to distribute it more uh, equally and we have to know how to reach needs without that much energy and imply because we won't replace that much energy with renewable. So I think that's the biggest thing that we have to start to think. What are actually the needs of our societies? What are our priorities where we want to spend energy because we think it's important? And where are the part where we have to say, okay, this is not the most important. And in face of this emergency, as it was said, if we are saying it's an emergency, we have to take emergency measures. So we have to accept that also, I think, at some point. Yeah. Well, for me, this is not a question. When, uh, like, if, if the economical growth is based on destroying our planet and destroying our uh, natural resources, then, then, of course, the economical gro growth is bad. And, uh, I think that now all of us can recognize that uh, uh, that like infinite economic growth of uh, GDP is not possible. Like when it's based of destroying planet, and we cannot uh, uh, destroy uh, our planet uh, all the time and again and again, uh, it's, it's just not possible because like uh, yeah. It's, uh, it has some limits and, uh, and the limit is climate change and uh, the limits of economic growth could, uh, it is like recognized by all of us right now and right here because it's quite hot in here, yeah. Yeah, I'm in the same position that uh, we are of course a campaign so I can't uh, talk about stuff that hasn't actually been agreed on and I can just talk about physics, uh, which means, uh, of course, we are limited. Uh, uh, the, uh, the EU uh, planetary budget of uh, what we get from the planetary life support system was, uh, uh, was exhausted by the 10th of May, according to calculations, and since then we are again overdrawing our budget. Uh, if, uh, and at, at the same time, if we want to avoid uh, uh, environmental collapse uh, and biodiversity collapse, there, there are proposals actually to cut, to only use half of the budget that uh, would be rightly in our, uh, uh, would, would, be, would be achievable if we exploited to, to the max, which would be the 10th of May, which would, if, we, if you add that up, uh, it would mean uh, taking uh, a sixth of the energy that we are consuming at the moment. So, so I can talk about the physics of this, uh, the planetary boundaries we are, we are uh, stuck up against. Uh, but I can't talk about the political solutions to that because basically in Extinction Rebellion we 
want to we want to leave these questions of how to solve the climate crisis and the ecological crisis uh, to the citizens assembly as a, as a, a democratic uh, as a democratic assembly of uh, where the whole of society can can uh, talk these things over of how to do it equitable of how to do it practically Sorry. Yeah, yeah, no worries. I'm so sorry and just put the question. I, yeah. I can't help the irony of saying that we can do some little action right now, as Emily has pointed to the necessity of saving energy. For example, we could stop unnecessarily using the beamer because we kind of know what it is about. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a suggestion. But okay. <laughs> So I'm going to give them a mic. Do you want a microphone? Okay, put a question and I will I, I give it. No. I'm sorry, first, the man behind who was the first one, you're going to be the second. Sorry? You raise your hand, no? Sorry, I did raise my hand. Yeah, yeah, so it's your time. Um, I know that I claim no special expertise in this. Um, I recently read an article on mindfulness. Mindfulness is a, like a combination of yoga, uh, meditation, lots of coloring books. And the idea behind mindfulness is it allows you to cope on an individual basis with the world around you. And sometimes the actions that we have to, which we're encouraged to do, seem like an ecological mindfulness. If I'm a vegan, if I recycle, if I, uh, use, if, if I use alternative forms of transport, then I'm taking individual actions to respond to a systemic problem. And so I was um, encouraged by our friend on the far left, by which I mean your seat is gone on my far left, um, when you spoke about system change. And so I think that is fundamental because any form of analysis of the growth, GDP and so forth, needs to be focused on the system uh, rather than on the outcomes or the individual actions or even group actions. And so I'm encouraged by the system change and I would like you to speak a little bit about how you envisage this fundamental change, because it feeds into, if there is an emergency, then perhaps we should take an emergency action. And so how can we um, move from this emergency to bring about system change? Yeah. Um, so, again, which is complicated here, it's uh, we don't necessarily have consensus on everything, uh, but what I can say is, what is important also is, if we want to build another system, we have to do it with rules which are also democratic, and where everyone can be included in the decision-making process. That's, we are, uh, as Limity, a uh, grassroots movement, so every decision that we take, we do it by consensus. So we have to discuss and to agree on what is common interest. And um, as a society, we also need to learn that, that it's, it's not going to be to face this emergency, some uh, central state saying we should do this measure and this measure, um, or we can't even, or, um, just wait and have hope for people to take their own decisions. We have to find a way to be again in the same table and discuss in different tables because we will need a big table otherwise, but you get the idea to be able to ask different communities to talk to each other and say, okay, what are our priorities actually? Uh, is my personal interest to do these things more important to the impact? Um, what we like, consider as something really important, what we consider as something which is not. Um, that's how we are going to build something, a decision, where we say, okay, this is not possible, and we agree as a community to not do these things anymore because it takes too much energy 
and we can't do it if we want that everyone have a share on our resources and what is uh, what we have as a all planet. So I think it's really important to be able to do this, and that's why when we are talking about um, different scale, where where we should ask individually, when we should ask uh, as a government and everything. I think it's important to be a way, um, to have a way to discuss at really low level or small groups because you can't discuss with one million people at the same time. Uh, but we have to be able to make these groups talk in a bigger way also and connect to have like communities. You have like, um, and this is not like um, theories of commons when you have resources, you have to share it and you have to find a way uh, to decide how to share it. Um, this way, this is energy in this case, because producing energy takes resources and we don't have infinite resources, so the question is how to do that. Um, I don't have a totally made up idea on how to do it. I have some ideas on my own, but that's not important. What is important is how we create these spaces to discuss about that and to agree on what should be done and what our priorities. I don't know if it's answer what you are. No, I think it's fascinating. I do think it's quite encouraging the way you're doing that. How, at the moment, here we are on Thursday evening, uh, Wednesday evening, who is your community? Okay, it depends on, uh, every community would depend on the resources you are talking about. If you're talking about water, your community will not, will not be the whole planet, because it's not how the water system works. It's going to be more in the scale of like your river, of your lake, or where you're living. If you are talking about uh, CO2 emission, it's going to be the whole planet. So you will have to find another way to uh, discuss things. So it depends on what you are talking about. If you have a forest and you need wood, it's going to be the people which are living near the wood and uh, depending on these resources. So you, we all are in different communities in this sense, depending on what we are doing. Currently, you're participating because the, the, the structures and the dialogue which you're describing, um, I find really quite an exciting uh, project. So, can you tell me specifically um, what communities you're involved in today? Okay, uh, myself, I will be involved in communities in uh, Prague because I'm living here. I will be involved in Limit Ismemi. Uh, as people which are concerned about the climate uh, issues, I will be involved for water from this, uh, which is this system. But for every community, you will have, if I'm doing uh, activities, cultural activity even, you will be involved in the community. If you're doing dance or things, you, your community will be the other ones participating in this activity with you. But I, I don't want to go further with it, and I, we, I will be happy to discuss with you after if you want. Yes. But because I'm not here to uh, do this, because it's, uh, it's going further than what we are doing as Liberty, so it's not my place to talk about this more. Well, thank this you. Yeah. There was one more question. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to uh, point out as far as a vision of uh, where we can go with the low carbon economy. Um, I know of two French writers. One is Philippe Bigouit, who came out with a book five years ago, L'Age de l'Ozac, um, where he brings into question not just the fact that we are creating carbon emissions, but that we have a technological economy which is based on resources which are limited and which will run out. For example, uh, in order to fertilize uh, the soil for agriculture, we are dependent upon large imports of phosphorus. However, the reserves of phosphorus in the world, if they are to be used at the current rate they're being used, they will run out in 70 years. So the agricultural system just cannot continue functioning the way it's functioning. The other writer is uh, Pablo Servin, who came out uh, five years ago with a book called uh, Feeding Europe in a Time of Crisis. And uh, both Bihuit and Servin pointed out that there is a nation in this world which has been enforced to adopting for the last 60 years a low carbon economy because that nation has been embargoed by the largest Western country for the last 60 years, and that nation is Cuba. And so he, they both, Bihuit and Serbina, pointed out that we should look to see how Cuba has solved their 
existence, solve the structure of their economy uh, in, a, in an enforced uh, low carbon uh, world. And how they've also managed to uh, uh, recreate a sustainable form of agriculture, which is able to feed everybody on an island with very few influence. Want to comment on this? Well, if there is no more questions on this topic, okay, one more. Well, I got one question. I hope one topic. Uh, you were saying that we are using too much resources, and then we have to scale that back. How would you explain that to get them on board to people who are living paycheck from, from paycheck to paycheck? Who are just, let's say, they are better off than people in developed countries, but they are relatively poor in here. Because it's easy to explain that to someone who's relatively rich, so you have to cut down, fine. But uh, if you are really just stretching your resources, how would you explain that to those people? transforming of work that uh, it's I think that it's clear that we have to start working in different way maybe less in general and I think this kind of people are really uh, tired and uh, usually work long hours and that uh, sh generally short our times we spend in work could be really useful for them and uh, they can care much about their family, about the uh, local things, and if they get the same wage for their work, I think it could be also good for them. Yes. Uh, I would just comment you and then you have a question. Uh, I just think that, I mean, that's the basic uh, comment usually here in Czech Republic on our let's say, wishing God countries. I just have to say, I believe that the, the climate change and climate ch crisis will affect first these people who are paying the checks from Czech. So that's why we are mentioning also the Green New Deal as uh, not just the environment movement, but also so sociologist or left wish, I would call it the movement, to fight the inequalities and to actually make uh, the first priority or the second priority is the level of the living of those people who are affected in the first row. So I think that's kind of the comment of the Green Deal. Uh, there was the first one. Uh, well, I think, I think that we are not uh, fighting uh, against climate change, but we are fighting for climate justice. Uh, because it's important and uh, we cannot uh, solve climate crisis by, by its causes. And uh, just, just look at people who, uh, who suffer, suffer most at the moment because of climate change. It, uh, for example, I'm talking about people uh, who are living on uh, island states uh, and uh, who are losing their home. Uh, well, you, you see that climate change is uh, just not uh, justify and uh, if we want to solve climate crisis we need to bring uh, justify solutions and I think that uh, I think I think that, that it's something that the climate movement is uh, is trying to do at the moment and of, of course we of, of course that uh, we don't know what uh, exactly to do because and, and we don't know how to uh, so or I don't know how to solve climate crisis uh, right now, right here, but uh, but we are trying to, and uh, whatever we are doing, we need to uh, yeah, we need to think in some consensual way, and uh, yeah, and uh, we need to uh, yeah, we need to remember that uh, that uh, without uh, justice, we we won't save uh, save our planet. Yeah, here in the Czech Republic it's uh, basically the same. Uh, I know lots of people who are fighting climate change by installing uh, air conditioning in their homes, right? So, uh, uh, and there are then those people who don't have the money to do that. Uh, there are those people who have to buy uh, potatoes now at, uh, at uh, 24 crowns. When they, just last year, they, they were only at six, 16 crowns a kilo. So, the climate change already has an impact a sizable impact on the life of the 
poorest in our, in our society. And I think uh, uh, there are two ways. You could either uh, institute a green uh, d dictatorship. Um, this has worked in the Dominican Republic. Uh, or there's the other way uh, of uh, sharing the few resources uh, that uh, we cut our s system down to, to uh, 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 and, and sharing that's more, more equitable. And then I think you actually have a large part of the, uh, of, of, uh, the poorest uh, members of our society on board because they are in the red race because they have to keep up at least the appearance with the Jones next door. But if you, if you actually take more from the Joneses, then then you ease the pressure on, on them too and at the same time you can gear the whole system to public transport that is uh, instead of cars you can so you can gear the whole system basically yeah uh, sort of along the lines of uh, what uh, was said about uh, cuba uh, uh, hopefully uh, hopefully at the same time avoiding the the bitter uh, poverty that most cubans live in Um, I just wanted to answer as well because it relates a bit to the topic of just transition that we're working on and so I, I can for example relate it to the coal mining region here in the Czech Republic where um, the idea is that those who are employed in the coal sector shouldn't just be made redundant from one day to another because we closed down the mine, mines and the power plants but there should be some uh, planned process of requalification and of course with green energy come also new jobs um, in that sector which are sometimes probably even better than working in a coal mine I would say, um, healthier as well. So I think combined with what uh, you said about working shorter hours which probably in the future will, will be a necessity um, it's also combined with employment in, in the green sector and also an important part of it is the public participation of the people who are affected by it. So for example in Useski region we're trying to get more of the locals to comment on the national action plans because those people know the best what they need and oftentimes nobody asks them about that and they just think they know better. Um, but yeah, I think with public participation you can go a long way in sort of setting up a system where, where these people do better than, than currently. Just a short comment, because I'm from the Moravia Silesian region and we had a kind of similar problem with the black coal mines and we managed it. So we already have a, I would call it more or less a, a positive experience of uh, giving people new jobs and requalification and trying to actually help them with their situation. So I believe that we can do it the same way with uh, other coal mines. Yeah, well, okay, sure. Uh, well, first of all, thanks for uh, all your inputs and I definitely have sympathy with, with the coals. That being said, you all talk about the need for more communication, for more dialogue, for more inclusiveness. And at the same time, if we are to take the video at face value and the general scientific consensus, we barely have the time to, to actually conduct any kind of dialogue on what needs to be done. I mean, I was happy that someone actually mentioned a climate dictatorship, uh, because that would be efficient enough. But Obviously, we don't desire the dictatorship, no one in their right mind would. But in the absence of that, and given the fact that we're talking about city uh, parts of climate emergency, which might result in a couple of trees here and there, or nothing any more substantial, um, what could something like, let's say, a one-child policy be, be one of the solutions because children are amongst the highest sources of, of emissions um, if we are to be absolutely drastic because you mentioned if I was to be correct complete emissions neutrality by 2025 
if right now we have Denmark trying to reduce by 70% in 2030, and they describe it as an Apollo 18, that, that, the Apollo 11 project, they don't know how to achieve it, but they want to. How do you imagine? Thanks for shutting up. Uh, how do you imagine uh, neutrality by 2025? Yeah, the parallel we are talking about is not uh, an Apollo, Apollo program, it's uh, talking about mobilization on, on uh, a parallel to uh, the mobilization during uh, the Second World War in the United States and, and uh, in, in Britain. So completely transforming the economy and gearing it towards, uh, to, towards uh, change uh, and, uh, and putting the priorities uh, of survival uh, front uh, and center. So uh, it's not an Apollo program, it's a World War II program and probably more drastic because uh, actually the future we are facing is more dire than if uh, we would have been conquered by fascism. Okay, two more questions. First, over there. I guess we back, back to, to, the, uh, to the question of, of justice. Um, uh, as long as I know that uh, about 50% of, of the CO2 emissions is made by 10% by of, of the richest uh, global wide, I don't know the figures in, in, in nationwide, uh, but this tells us that uh, from another perspective, uh, the, 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 the bottom 90%, uh, uh, they are sustainable, they're living in a sustainable way. So uh, we can turn also the other way around. But, uh, the, those most affected by, by some cuts uh, would be uh, those of the, of the top 10%. Uh, <clears throat> We used to think that maybe we don't spend so much or don't make so much CO2, but we are the 20th uh, country which is, um, yeah, forced polluting. So maybe it will be us too. And it's hard to, yeah, remember and. <laughs> well, in Czech Republic. Well, let's call our Prime Minister to cut his CO2 emissions, no? I mean, since we speak about the richest ones. But, uh, well, actually this week, the, the billionaires in the US call again that they want to pay taxes and they want to invest them to the people back. So, we can push kind of these ideas also and uh, I agree. I would, I would even put the, the progressive taxation on them. But that's maybe the other discussion for the next panel. I just, I'm just so worried about uh, the rich people talking about taxes because I'm worried about any individual approach towards that. Mm -hmm. Every person like Elon Musk saying I'm not going to pay my taxes is not going to solve the problem. Just the same way, even though it's very good to recycle and we all should do it, definitely we're not talking about this anymore. We're talking about changing the politics right now in larger scale. So I'm, I would be very worried if we would start thinking always individually to this problem. That's just a reaction. Yeah, yeah, sure. Just uh, an, an explanation of a citizen's assembly, like just in more detail. Oh. Yeah, we see uh, the political system is uh, basically broken. It's visible not only with uh, the, the climate crisis that has not been solved over the last 30 years, but actually gotten much worse over the last 30 years since uh, the IPCC was founded. Uh, so uh, we uh, propose an addition to it, uh, which is uh, not actually thought up by us. It's just, uh, uh, it would be um, harking back on the one hand to, to uh, uh, democracy in, uh, in, uh, and uh, in antiquity, uh, which was also based on sortition where people were chosen by lot 
and uh, as uh, real representatives of, uh, of the people, of uh, uh, the, the whole community, uh, uh, because, of course, uh, professional politicians, that is our system today, go through lots of filters. There are lots of lawyers in there, not, not a lot of plumbers. Uh, and uh, so we, uh, we, 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 we want to... Uh, it's actually interesting because it's uh, something that uh, politicians are uh, uh, very, uh, very keen on, on this, uh, uh, because they have these hot potato uh, questions and they are very often glad. They know they are very important issues, but they don't want to touch them, so they are glad to outsource them to uh, bodies of uh, citizens drawn by sortition. And uh, it's also called deliberative polling, which means people are not just polled on one day and uh, those with the biggest TV stations determine the outcome of, of, of a random or polling, but they are actually in the, in, uh, hanging in there for uh, several weeks, maybe months, talking uh, about the issues uh, the, and uh, then uh, as a group of several hundred people coming to to conclusions that uh, have demo democratic legitimacy because they were uh, put forward by people who are uh, true uh, representatives of the whole of the population because they were drawn by a lot. Any question more or comment? Okay, one. So two more and we will move from another level. Uh, so, yeah, thank you for all the input here. And, uh, yeah, I just wanted to um, stress again in my eyes the importance of this uh, economic aspects of social, or aspects of social policies. I would say that even one of the justifications for our focus on uh, economic growth was historically, it was presented as a way to combat uh, poor, uh, uh, people being poor, and it kind of was uh, based on the promise that through this uh, economic growth, the poverty will be solved. And as it is shown now, this is not working, but I think the fundamental question remains there, that the poverty is an uh, important uh, topic, and uh, I think, as, as it was mentioned, that since we are facing such an existential threat of these uh, climate changes and crises, I think much more uh, bold uh, solutions should be <coughs> on the table. So solutions like radical <coughs> reduction of the working hours. There was some defector from the UK saying that as one of the measures to directly combat climate change would be to reduce the working hours to nine hours per week. Or, or at least on the UK, but I think we can extrapolate it onto the whole European Union. It seems, it seems uh, like unimaginable, but on some, on some level, but I would say that I want, I, I want this to be a really realistic demand that yes, this, this type of radical action is needed to, because I think the step like this to so radically reduce the working hours has, a, has a lots of consequential uh, effects and impact on the society, how we how we have to change our uh, you know, patterns of living, like uh, work going to work, not going to work, uh, how, how we spend our free time, and it also impacts on on I as I see, like people currently employed in a work in a full time working uh, contract are, I think, so preoccupied or so tired of of, of this work that they are unable to uh, even consider this topic like climate change, which I think people from academia have time and energy to really go to, to really work on. But I think in order to reach much wider audience and to make them uh, aware of this and understand the consequences, I think we need to make them 
much less, much less busy with a with a meaningless uh, meaningless jobs that many of our current jobs are actually. So, and for me, this is a good example of a really radical agenda that needed needs to be presented. And I think it kind of links even to the previous topic of pressuring the governments to declare climate emergency. I consider climate emergency really a PR exercise. And I think, as it was mentioned, Canada, even Prague 6 and so on, I think they declare it, but they don't. I, I, I think we will need to really demand very concrete or much more concrete steps from, uh, from these bodies. So, in, in context of Prague, I think in the like like today, this is the hottest day of the of the year. So I think it would make sense to do now that Prague radically imposes some restrictions on the car travel, not only due to CO2 emissions, but purely by the heat that the car produces. I think it is it would have, it would have been so much sensible a policy to to do. And so I think. Yeah, I just want to push for more radical demands from from our citizens towards the uh, government bodies. Yeah, I'm not all of them are vegetarian. I'm sorry. I just get them for free, and I didn't want to throw it away. Uh, just a short comment, I would be happy if you can join uh, us in some other discussions because we are trying, as I said, we are trying to put these ideas together and reunite the ideas, not just one single program. And we already cooperate with some people from universal basic in income organizations and that might be also the solution. So I, I would be happy to, to support that and to speak about it and more. And we had one more question. Um, yeah, I mean, this is a question to basically anyone on the panel. Um, I'm British, and uh, and so therefore I'm uh, I've inherited imperialism as my birthright. I don't go out and conquer or con or colonize places habitually, but my status in the world very fact that I'm speaking English. My status in the world is an inheritance of imperialism. And I can stand up, oh, my, my family's very working class, we're all miners and farm laborers. But in reality, my status is based upon an imperial past. Um, and so the wealth of my country is a nice historic wealth which has been built up over a series of time. And so my education and my so social expectations have been based upon this historical inequality between different nations. Now, what I see in some of the things that we should be talking about is almost like a resource imperialism. That certain countries around the world are, are there's a huge inequality between different countries in the world because the wealthier, more powerful countries have been drawing resources from the for a less powerful country. Now, Pedro was talking about climate justice, which sounds wonderful. Um, and we were talking about people's assemblies, and that whole structure sounds really exciting. But how do we persuade, two questions, how do we persuade people in this country that we're rich? Because as somebody who's lived in this country for some time, every time that topic is brought, no, 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 Britain is rich, the Czech Republic are poor. We can't afford to do these things. So part of the question for climate justice, if we treat it as a global question, is to persuade people in this country that they are rich and powerful, and that they, we can talk about moral duty or political duty, or whatever, but they need to recognize that disparity. Um, the second question is that once you've persuaded the people, what can we do on a global basis to bring about that greater equality or that greater equity between the two, from not the two, but many different countries around the world. Um, are we going to do it within nation states, which I'm skeptical of? Or is there somewhere, I mean, this is one of the questions of what you were talking about, communities. How do we operate on a global community level? 
How do you persuade the people in the National Assembly of People's Assemblies? National Assembly sounds good because it's the French Revolution. The People's Assemblies, that they are rich and so they must think globally and act globally. But that's a question to anyone, really. Well, I will first answer as a Green New Deal for Europe, because that's the program for whole Europe, which of course in the global world is one of the biggest, but it's not the main important. Of course, we have to cooperate with other countries. But for sure, of course, since you probably heard about the Green New Deal in the US with Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Bernie Sanders on the board, but also here in Europe, that is not just the Czech Republic or in UK, where the action organization is much bigger than here in Czech Republic. So we believe that we have to cooperate all together. And uh, the inequality I will leave for the next popular, because that's actually the topic which I wanted to mention more. Uh, more. And now if you want to answer. Um, that's maybe another look at the imperialism that you mentioned and um, how to persuade Czech people that we're rich. Okay, I don't know how to do that, but I think one good argument for um, increased climate action of the Czech Republic is our historic emissions, which together, um, if we accumulate it over our whole history, are one of the highest in the world. Actually, until I think 1960s, we were in the top 10 emitters in the whole world as Czechoslovakia because we were a very industrial nation. So, if now somebody says the argument that we shouldn't reduce our emissions because China isn't, um, we should always say that historically we have such a debt of emissions that we have to um, reduce them much more. Same goes for Britain and, and other yeah, Western countries. Um, I just want to say that uh, this question is not about morality and it's not about that we can help or we uh, don't have to help, it's just about survival. So we are not deciding if we are rich and we will help these poor people, we are just fighting for uh, survival. I, and I just think maybe people in Czech Republic don't think they are rich because in fact they are not. We have li really low incomes and there are only few people who uh, get the money for this dirty business we have there. So uh, I think we don't have to proceed and that we are help. We have just to proceed and we have to do something with it and that we are uh, protecting something and yes, that it's just not helping others, it's helping ourselves. Well, the, the first question, I think that, that it's something we are talking about all the time. We are still uh, lesser affected by climate change than uh, than people in the rest of the world, uh, and uh, especially people from so-called uh, global south. And uh, but we are still, uh, or, or like, or like, like uh, the the injustice of uh, of climate change and uh, of uh, of responsibility for climate change could be also seen in Czech Republic and it's like, uh, you know, like like there is there is some difference between like uh, people in Czech Republic in general and between uh, people from Global South but uh, but there is still as well some, some difference between uh, between like rich people in Czech Republic and, and poor people in Czech Republic and uh, yeah, and I think this is something we need to explain people and uh, uh, and also, like the the just the, the just transition is also answer for for this question, because uh, yeah, because we know that uh, that the transition and that solution of climate crisis uh, should not affect uh, people in global south, or but maybe people people who are poor here in Czech Republic, and uh, the. Second, the, the second question, like I have, I have no idea. <laughs> like uh, I think, uh, I also think that I, I cannot have, uh, I, I, I cannot have idea about this because, uh, because I don't believe in, I, I don't believe in solutions that uh, that are brought and made by uh, by one person. I think it should be always on, uh, on 
on some based on some decision making of uh, of group of people. And uh, if uh, if we believe in people, and I really believe in people, we just <laughs> we just have to uh, continue believing, and we uh, we should do what uh, what is in our possibilities. And I think that uh, that the, the uh, society is trying to somehow work on the uh, as well on the international level as well on the on the local level and actually that's why uh, why we uh, have something as uh, as nations or like states that are based on on nations uh, that's why we have uh, united nations and uh, and it's not something that is that is definitive it's something it, it's just some uh, something we try and uh, now we are probably uh, yeah now we are we can probably see that it's, uh, it wasn't uh, it wasn't so good idea and we can uh, move it forward and uh, all this all this needs uh, yeah all this needs to believe uh, needs some some beliefs in, in like uh, in humans and uh, and also also we need to be somehow somehow brave as uh, like like all the time people when we are trying to build some community because we are uh, we are all the time working in community the question is how we are working in in community and whether we are working uh, according to our ideals yeah we are talking about um, going out of our comfort zone to go actually face up to the situation that we are in and uh, so uh, that also means actually we are building community tonight, I think, right? So uh, we are trying to build community when we are politically or uh, active, when we are active uh, to, to fight against climate change, we are already trying to build uh, those human connections. And uh, um, we are, okay, so we are talking about big, big problem, uh, existential problem for, for organized uh, civilization on this planet at least. Uh, but uh, let's talk, uh, uh, the, this, this civilization has had successes in the past, for instance, the Montreal Treaty on, on uh, 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 ozone uh, and uh, uh, has worked in the international framework that we have at the moment with the, the UN and uh, uh, national governments. Uh, so there is a retreat on, uh, of the uh, ozone hole over the, over the poles uh, over the last 30 years with, uh, with the treaty. And uh, for climate change, of course, it's not uh, far too uh, little ambition in it. But we have international agreements, that, uh, that, or we at least have the framework to put, uh, to put uh, treaties in, in place that, that have more teeth than, than they have at the moment. So we should, I think, we should uh, focus on that. We should, uh, we should mobilize the 69% of people in the Czech Republic that think that climate change is real, it's a real danger, and the state Specifically, the state and the government should do much more about it. So we should mobilize them to put actually pressure on, on the government, on the state, to act. And uh, of course, in that process, and by building communities, we are of course also trying to educate them and educate ourselves on what that means and to take further steps. I just have to sit here. I agree. <laughs> Let's do it. Uh, if you just remind me, uh, I, would, I think it was last week, there was a political discussion, in, I think it was a Czech TV. And there was somebody from Slobodny, which is like the most craziest uh, right-wing party in Czech Republic, let's say. And the discussion was actually on climate crisis or global warming. And I believe we shouldn't have any more these discussions. We can't do it anymore that we we are able to even communicate if it is existing or not, or if it's caused by humans or not, or even if we can change it, or if it's just natural. I believe that we are already beyond this, and we shouldn't like any speak anymore about this. And if anybody asks, just say no. That's the reality. That's the the results, and let's face it. 
not speak anymore about this if it's real or not and if we can change it or not because I believe we can. And the second comment about the transition or about the change, the global change, uh, just the topic, there was a non-led gasoline change or transition which in Germany took 12 years because there was a huge pressure of, uh, of the business and a huge pressure of the lobbyists on the government, of course, the, some politicians and all the stuff around. It took more than 12 years to change it and then really, really cancel it. And for example, in China, it took less than two years. It was almost one and a half. So maybe we really need something more radical and really trying to push them more not just having a, a long-term discussions for like next 12 years of changing a small parts of the economy of the system, but really coming with the radical idea and trying to, as you said, mobilize people. Can I, can I ask a question about education? Because it's been mentioned here and it's a topic I really enjoy because I'm a teacher. And uh, I wanted to ask about um, what is the state, like to, to all speakers, what is the state of education uh, concerning environment in, in the Czech Republic or, or ecology and like a climatic crisis and so on? Because, you know, I'm Polish, so. Uh, <sighs> I'm sorry. Uh, I also. <laughs> uh, uh, well, I don't agree with my government. To, to my uh, I used to teach uh, civics for a while. Uh, I finished like, I don't know, maybe four years ago. Maybe there's been massive changes, but I, I doubt so. So there is hardly any, uh, on, on lessons of civics, there is hardly any focus on the ecology or on the like, kind of environmental changes, climatic, uh, like emergency, whatever, you know, like the kind of discussion we are having here. It's more like, not even John Paul II, who is very, um, you know, appreciated in Poland and in the book of civics there was a picture of his that this is a role model to many people around the world, just by chance, whatever, it was a state school. Uh, the point is that nobody even listens to John Paul II's, uh, you know, uh, guidance or whatever, guidelines what, in terms of uh, how to at least, you know, be kind to nature, do not consume so much. On the other hand, I mean, there's like lack of this reflection. So sorry for 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 you know, sorry for this long uh, intervention, but the, the point is that you know on one page you get a picture of John Paul II and how you know how we all adore him, but there is no actual talk about what he what he preached except for no abortion. Never mind. Um, and on the another page you got actually um, you know apotheosis of CEOs who work in sales and they are called as the elite of society. Those higher ten percent who can sell sand on the desert. I, I'm sorry, I, I internalized this quote because it was so appalling, right? So um, I was wondering, what is the situation like in the Czech Republic? Whether like, uh, because obviously in Poland is this kind of neoliberalism at its, at its worst, right? And ecology is like, oh yeah, let's, let's segregate rubbish, that's all. Um, I, I know that Pet is one of the organizers, right? Of, of, or the organizer, I mean, where did this initiative come from? From you, from the students, or actually from the teachers? Also, sorry, like just one more thing, because in Poland teachers are heavily underpaid. Uh, so I've heard they are here, but I think in Poland it's much worse. And therefore, most of the teachers, unfortunately, are not intelligentsia, because people do not have time to read, they have to have a lot of jobs, uh, so they don't care. Teachers usually don't care about the issue. And I was wondering, what is the story like here? Uh, well, as a teacher by education, mm -hmm. I would just super short comment. Yes, we're facing the similar or even the same problems with low pay and everything. Second, I and usually, like the uh, the let's call it, I wouldn't call it more intelligent, but more open professors or teachers are usually actually end up being in other businesses mm -hmm. as managers or anything else because of the low low payment and everything else. And at least what I was teaching, and it's not that, that long time ago, nobody pushed me to educate about the climate justice or the change. I mean, if I want to, I can present to the students, but no, nobody said, like, that's the note which you should teach them this year, and you should say this and this. Like, nobody did that. 
Uh, I hope that uh, now it's a little bit better because it's the more public topic and maybe Peter will tell us a little bit more. Uh, well, there is something called the uh, Ramsworth Javati programming. It's like the, uh, like the education plan where, where you have all, all those topics that, uh, that you should like uh, teach, teach the children. And there is also there is also quite uh, quite a huge part about uh, about like uh, ecology and environment, and there is also possibilities for elementary school to have a subject called uh, 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 ecological education. Uh, it's the uh, Vichovac uh, ecology, uh, or you can like. Or, or you can have like those topics in, in different subjects. And uh, when I was in second class, class it, mean, it means I was like seven or eight. We had uh, we had this subject, and we were talking in there about ecology, but it was like about uh, how we should re recycle. And uh, oh, yeah, like the paper is uh, the paper is going to uh, to blue uh, <laughs> to blue trash bin and things like this. And we were talking like about the uh, uh, about like the uh, about like the water in the uh, like water in the nature, and we uh, went to few trips, and it was like yeah, well, it was it was great because it uh, it makes some uh, relationship between like students and uh, and environment, but uh, it still wasn't enough, and I have no idea how it uh, yeah how it is. Uh, how how it uh, how it looks with this subject uh, at the moment? Probably they are talking uh, in the about global warming, uh, not probably about climate change. And uh, nobody actually, actually nobody nobody wants to talk uh, at school because like like about climate change. And I think it's because uh, climate change is something that uh, uh, that is caused uh, because of bad politics. Politics and in our school, uh, we uh, we are told that uh, that we should be like political and we shouldn't discuss politics. But uh, it's it's quite a it's quite a mess, and I think that just probably uh, teachers are so scared to talk about like about like political topics and to uh, to have probably some uh, some opinions in class. Actually, actually, I I and there was like like the second part of the question, like. I heard for the first time about climate change uh, from the uh, from the uh, English book. It was uh, it was like there was vocabulary and it was focused on environment, and there was like the word climate change. Uh, and uh, yeah, Fridays for Future, like in the beginning, Fridays for Future in Czech Republic uh, was uh, was based on on few people uh, that were involved in uh, in climate movement, like it was. Like in the in the beginning, we were there were three of us uh, who were members of uh, of the uh, One of our tasks at uh, Extinction Rebellion is to translate lots of stuff because uh, the literature in Czech is quite limited, and so uh, the literature available in English is uh, much richer. So, uh, but uh, my son, uh, my uh, oldest son, is in uh, sixth grade. And uh, half a year ago, I asked him whether he had, whether he knew what uh, global warming or climate change was, whether he had, had ever heard of it, and he said no. But now he says his geography teacher is going on about climate change every single week. So, <laughs> so there seems to, uh, seems there are changes happening. Yeah, um, I think. It uh, all comes again about time, and um, if we don't have this at school, then I, th I think that's what I really like about Friday for Future, is to say at some point, then if we do, are not talking about the most important things for our future at school, then let's try and do it ourselves. And we were talking about that to say, we, need, we have uh, a timeline which is really short to make huge changes in how we are organized our society to face the crisis. But if we say it's an emergency, then let's take time and uh, let's work less to have time to discuss all these topics. Or let's just not work at all if, uh, and just say, okay, as a country we say we just do the emergency and we all start to discuss together
to take decisions on how to change our society, if it's really a priority. And if it, otherwise, if we are just co continuing our everyday life, um, like find on Wednesday a bit of time to go to discuss about this topic, then of course it will take years to manage to, my, to make a decision. But if we really decide to say, our priority is right now not to build lockers, to sell them to tourists in the center of Prague in the company, but is to discuss about our future, then let's do it. And I think it's really what it is about. And to build um, um, popular education on those topics and create resources. And we have a lot of new channels of communication, so let's use them. Uh, we have internet, we can like, create discussion about it. We can not do a lot of things to make this topic uh, central and I think it's really important to to really see that that our most research resource is time so if we consider that we have like an emergency let's take time to face it mentioned abortion and it was uh, just uh, once again mentioned here the reduction of uh, one children to, uh, to family so I uh, just want to talk about feminism a little bit Donna Haraway said that uh, Mm, the climate change is really uh, connected with overpopulation. You also said, said it, and uh, I think so. In the education, we have to stop teach uh, girls that it's our own obligation to have children. And I don't, don't think that we sh have to do some strict uh, rules like only one children to family. I think that it's enough to leave freedom to women to decide if they want to have children or not. And then maybe it could solve it all. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, to your question, uh, b before 20 years when I was on the school, I found some book about climate change for kids and there were all the important uh, information. And I found it only because I did some uh, biologist Olympics or some, uh, something completely mirrored. But yeah, it's crazy that all the information was b b uh, 20 years ago here in one book for child but we cannot do anything for this. It only gets worse. Maybe if I can just add quickly, like it's not a coincidence that the countries where climate change is not properly taught at school are the ones that are the least progressive on agreeing to the target. So it's a very important topic definitely to, to address and it's the only way forward I think if we want to do something and yeah we don't have much time so we Hopefully, some changes to the curriculum can happen quite soon. If I can pick up on this, because I understand that you represent an NGO. Do you work with teachers, actually? We personally don't, but there are some NGOs um, that do work with teachers and provide trainings for how to teach climate change, or there are even people that come to classrooms to have like one-off um, session about climate change. That I know about if you wanted to get contacts <laughs> afterwards. So. Thanks. Was it a question or to comment on the topic? I would like to stay on the topic of education. Uh, it was a comment to the previous topic, so I'll let you discuss and if, if you're... Anybody has a comment on education? Okay. studying in high school right now and uh, uh, we were supposed to um, um, uh, talk about the um, um in, uh, in June uh, and in the uh, end of the school year and uh, but we didn't manage it because we were talking about genetics and uh, suddenly there was not enough time for ecology so <laughs> Be like uh, our teacher uh, or biologist said that uh, uh, if we want to pass uh, the final exams from biology, uh, we can study it at home. <laughs> and uh, she gave us some materials uh, on the internet, and that's all. 
then we have then we have uh, our teacher of chemistry uh, who says that uh, climate change doesn't exist and that I'm a um, climate alarmist. So I think that uh, uh, the situation at uh, Czech high schools, I'm studying uh, gymnasium, uh, uh, and I, I think it's not a bad, uh, bad school, but uh, the situation with talking about climate change is, I don't know how to describe it. Uh, wait a Um, I'm wondering, should we talk about education or like mobilization? Because the fact is, we have a stance here. We're not neutral. We're like, we want change and we want the, the humanity to not decay and be extended. We, we don't want to be neutral and say, oh, we, uh, we can do maybe uh, some liberal things, some kind of. Uh, put a band-aid on, on a thing, but we, we want to mobilize people to, to take action. We don't just want to, to have teacher who say to us, like, oh, we need to change that, because uh, it's, it's alarming. Everybody knows it. It's, it's like we always say that a lot of people want to make more action, but they don't know how to what, or where to act. It's like, I mean, we feel a little lonely seeing, uh, seeing only, uh, I don't know, uh, a, a, uh, a lecture about climate change and afterwards we go back to our home and we cannot, I don't know, like, go and strike like the students. That's a collective action, that's something that's meaningful, that's like mass movements and there, there's a stance and I don't know. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to induce here a, a little bit of opposition between my education and mobiliza mobilization. I don't, I don't know if, if you see, see like see it in the same way as me. I'm asking also a question. Yeah. Well, just short comment, and maybe there's an answer. Well. I didn't want to mention it, but I think in Czech Republic sometimes it's even worse because you probably heard about former president Václav Klaus and now his son with his new party. And me as a teacher, I can't explain any ideology, probably including somehow of changing the system uh, in the school to, to the kids. Because if the kids sit at home and the teacher will complain in school, well, they're going to have a big problem as a teacher in school which basically is stupid, I think so. But there's another level in Czech Republic that our former, prime, former uh, president and prime minister, Václav Klaus, he's saying that he's a professor, and since he's a professor, he can speak to kids, and he can speak on schools or universities, and he can even give them free books. And of course, he's saying that it doesn't exist. It's not, we can't change it by people. And it's just the normal and all the bullshit around. So I think that's at least that was the background where I grew up. And they were saying that. Of course, I disagree already before, but that's the background in Czech Republic. And so I really like the idea that we should fight even this you know, with our education, with the schools, with the teachers, and telling them. Because there are some programs, as Peter mentioned, there are programs of education. But of course, the school is kind of free to accept it or not, and the teacher can say, okay, I will do it or I will not do it, and it's really just volunteer. And I disagree with that, so I believe that we should try to push also on this level. And, yeah. Well, I think the main problem is uh, in setting of the debate uh, on climate change in Czech Republic. Uh, because, uh, because in Western Europe and in a lot of other countries, the discussion is about uh, how to solve climate crisis and how to reduce CO2 emissions. In Czech Republic, uh, the, the, uh, the debate always was about the existence of climate change. And I think it is still a problem and we can, uh, like, we can meet climate deniers almost everywhere, but it's changing a lot and, uh, and the debate is moving forward. And, uh, and it's something that, uh, that, we are also, that we also have to fight with, for example, like uh, 
two weeks ago I was invited uh, to uh, uh, one uh, private uh, private Czech TV, uh, Prima it's called, and uh, I was invited into debate with uh, with Ladislav Jakov. Ladislav, yeah. Uh, and he's like Prime Mayor and Nazi in the same time. And uh, like, w why should I discuss with uh, someone who denies the, the science? Like, like we should. Like, I'm I'm 17 years old uh, old student and I just cannot discuss science. And uh, and it's some problem with facts. Like some people some people uh, like to uh, have uh, their own truth and uh, they just don't want to believe uh, what uh, what scientists are. Talking about and actually, like in some way, I do understand it because because it's uh, yeah, it's I, I think it's, for all of us it's it's, uh, it's hard to accept the the climate crisis because it's something so terrible that uh, that I don't know when I first uh, when I first heard about climate change it was just so strange and uh, uh, it was like so so terrible for me that I didn't want to believe uh, believe to climate crisis as well. Well, I think that uh, both uh, Klaus' father and his son are intelligent enough to actually know about the science about uh, climate change and it's just a ploy and this ploy and this, these lies about the state of the climate and our role in the climate and climate change uh, thrives on our passivity uh, uh, and on uh, on them uh, given free reign to, to go on with their lives. So this mass mobilization, for instance, against the current government actually airs, uh, it airs uh, the true um, the, the state of, of, uh, of, of the mind of most people, or at least uh, the most active people, and also the, uh, puts the Klaus in a bind. Uh, he, he was. He had to apologize because he is threatened by this uh, by, by this movement. So they are, and and we can again. So this mobilization of people, when they build communities, when they mobilize, they actually, um, yeah. There's no 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 other option and no other uh, solution to to debate than actually come uh, coming up uh, at least a, a little a little bit closer to tr uh, to the truth and. Uh, uh, so, we as uh, Extinction Rebellion in the Czech Republic at the moment, for instance, we are uh, still too small to to do what uh, 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 our uh, co-rebels in, in Britain have, be, have been doing, but they, for instance, organized teachers, uh, and they blocked, uh, uh, blockaded and protested at the Ministry of Education, and I think it's not only to educate kids and then wait till they grow, uh, grow up, but it's also about educating kids and these kids then educating their parents about the, the truth of climate change. And uh, in Britain they have already uh, put pressure on the BBC and on other media to, to tell the truth, to move away from this charade of uh, climate, uh, climate debate. And uh, that's uh, something we, we uh, are hoping to do very soon in Czech Republic too. Uh, just a technical comment, uh, because we are kind of running out of time. So there was a two hours debate, so I would assume ten minutes more or less, the last words, and then we can continue on non-official discussions with peers and all the stuff around. <laughs> more of a comment to the previous topic, um, which is linked to, uh, you know, the poor and, uh, like, who will pay for the change itself. If, oh, sorry, I'm not really experienced with microphones. Um, I think we've touched on an important topic, uh, because from, uh, from, like, a country who are of the global south who are more impacted by the climate change and from uh, to the uh, like profit-driven companies who said lobbyists to lobby against uh, movements like these. It's really important, in my opinion, to think about if this uh, crisis is even possible.
foreseeable or it's even solvable in uh, the free market environment driven by free market uh, motivations and rules. And I think this might come obvious to many of us here, but uh, yeah, it's just to me it kind of seems impossible because when you're like when you're as an individual country try to um, enforce policies uh, that, for example, limit your uh, current usage and so on. So yeah, you're putting yourself into a um, uh, disadvantage in comparison to others. And if um, if you're stuck in this kind of uh, competitive uh, mindset, it might be near impossible to solve. I'm sorry I started that uh, is uh, it's like mm. well, what about the last two questions or topics. Uh, I would love to enlarge the discussion a bit. Um, because we were talking about uh, climate emergency but also about climate justice. Uh, so like the Green New Deal is proposed for Europe is proposing like a really specific economical solution which are connected with the uh, uh, Central Europe Bank and stuff. But I'm also interested, as you are part of this um, environmental group, uh, uh, well, but the problem is global. So I'm really interested uh, if you think like your groups should be also like interested in how we should push the top pollu polluters in the world like to change their approach. There are ways, and I think it's also like important to not only think of Europe but like world because I don't think that Europe can like. Uh, change other, everything, uh, and the other, on the other hand, like uh, it seems to me like really like the top responsibility of us who are kind of aware, like to come with these ideas and discuss them kind of uh, now, so we can like uh, have some proposal for government which are not really like acting right now. Just what did he comment concerning population as, as a driver for climate change? Um, I, I, I've seen some data that during the, the last 25 years, uh, the population has grown uh, by, by 35%, which is not li little, uh, but uh, the CO2 uh, 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 the, the CO2 emissions have grown by 163%, uh, and that the uh, so uh, and, 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 uh, yeah. and so, so um, I think it's rather the the, uh, the, uh, the industry output which which uh, which makes this different. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I have an idea because we are running out of time that uh, we will make a comment of the on these three comments, and if you can make like a last ideas or if you have anything else to say from the panelists. So feel free to say it. So who wants to start? I will start from this side right now. Okay. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, climate uh, camp, Clima Camp is starting right now. You should definitely go if you have the time. Uh, if you don't have the time, uh, at least come for the weekend. Right, yeah. uh, and uh, then there are two slow months in the Czech Republic, uh, July and August, where not much is happening, but you can still do something in your community and your, your uh, and then in in September there are some big dates coming up. Uh, it's uh, September 20th. Uh, the Fridays for Future has called for a global uh, climate strike. And then in uh, October, uh, Extinction Rebellion wants to do an international rebellion with uh, blockading, blocking um, massive civil disobedience uh, across the globe, where they are. So uh, be prepared and uh, yeah, keep going. Shall we? Shall we comment the question? Yes, yes. Well, I just I just wanted uh, like in addition to uh, to debate about the uh, overpopulation. Like we could see see here the, uh, the diagram of uh, of how uh, yeah like CO two emissions per person and, and that it's uh, somehow about the wealthy. 
and uh, and it seems like a lot, like I think it it clearly shows that that the problem is not so so much with overpopulation as uh, with overconsumption. Uh, simply, uh, it's not about uh, how many people are living in here, or it's not like the, the main issue. Uh, the thing is how how we are living in here, like uh, like how we are how we are behaving, and uh, and how and especially how how uh, the richest and the, the biggest uh, uh, pro producers are behaving. Uh, like uh, in conclusion, like I just remembered for uh, like when we are, when we were like discussing the, the changes and uh, and the policies and the political parties i just uh, i just wanted to remember you that uh, that for example greta Thunberg in in sweden she's striking against government that is made by social democrats and by greens and uh, i remembered for one quote uh, from uh, nadezhda tolokonikova uh, from Pusyar, from from Pusyar. And uh, she said that uh, uh, even even the ideal uh, president or politicians won't uh, bring you anything. If you want something and if you uh, want to change uh, the place where you are living somehow, you have to go and you have to take it. And uh, that's why all of us should uh, join the climate movement and participate in the, in, uh, the activities uh, that uh, have been mentioned here, and uh, for the very end, when like I uh, uh, when I was already quoting, and uh, when we were debating about uh, Václav Klaus, I want to I want to uh, yeah I, I want to tell you one quote from Václav Klaus that is about climate change, and he said we lost. <laughs> No, just just to explain you, he, he said some, something like uh, like when it's going about like about like climate change, uh, we lost, and uh, and it means that that like they they lost the fight, uh, and or or he said that they like they lost the fight uh, and the debate about the existence of climate change. Okay, I just want to yeah, thank you all of you one comment to free market. Uh, if, 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 is it possible to solve climate um, situation with free market? I, uh, I think that we think about uh, selling many products uh, with no responsibility, responsibility as something as our freedom, but I think that it's much more normal to take responsibility for what we are making it from, which work is behind it, and what kind of impact it has on uh, of climate and on nature. So I hope we can transform it and pay much higher taxes on the things that really make uh, some bad impact, yes, and uh, on the other hand, make uh, uh, this more sustainable um, businesses uh, cheaper and more acceptable for people. Okay, and yeah, I have no quote. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'll pick the question about how to make the biggest global polluters um, pay. Um, well, in ideal world, we would have a worldwide carbon tax on have a tax on carbon and every emitter would have to pay and the revenue would be redistributed so that those who are most affected by climate change would get the most. But we don't live in an ideal world um, still. But for example, programs like the EU emissions trading scheme, they are starting to work, like the prices of the allowances are going up and it's pushing the companies that emit emissions to to actually do something to invest into um, other sources, for example, of energy or to reinvent themselves. So that's working. Ideally, this would be also interconnected with uh, similar schemes in other countries, like there were talks with connecting the EU with Canada, for example, because then it would prevent carbon leakage and like our, us outsourcing production elsewhere where the carbon tax isn't so high for the price. Um, so yeah, I think like the more cooperation um, among nations 
for example, within the UN framework, as, such as the Paris Agreement, like they're really important and yeah, it should be happening faster, but it's at least a good sign that something is happening. And yeah, the more pressure we put on politicians, the more they will have to act. So yeah, <laughs> that's my last word. Okay, uh, so on the topic of uh, free market and uh, how to make pressure on big groups which are actually really putting uh, this situation, uh, I think we uh, have to be really vigilant when we are doing name and shame things to push divest on these things because sometimes what is just happening is that some groups which have some uh, needs to protect their image are just going to sell these really shitty uh, companies and shitty activities to groups which don't care at all about their image and just want to make as much money as possible. That's, for example, uh, the case with Pochiradi um, coal power plant in Czech Republic. Chess, which is the uh, state-owned company uh, for coal, is going to sell it. But they're not going to close it. They're just going to sell it to private companies which don't care about the image and just want to make as much money on it. So it's a real issue. And if we are still on the free market and the only thing which is going to uh, decide at the end is how much money we can do with things, we have a big problem. Um, but uh, I think it's really important to remember that we can't put uh, our own uh, private right to invest or to consume things are always uh, uh, more important than the common interest. And we, have a lot, we are already able to things that we are not able to do because we know it's going to uh, affect the liberty of others. So it's really, and people are able to understand that, and I think it's really important to uh, emphasize that when we are trying to push to make changes and to make fa um, uh, phase out of uh, industry which are really polluting and destroying uh, the liberty of others to live in a sustainable world. And uh, that's, yeah, that's going to be it for this question. And, um, and yeah, and you are always welcome to uh, join Climate Camp to discuss furthermore uh, about all the topics. And uh, if you need more information about it, uh, you can just uh, come to me and I will be able to uh, provide it. Thank you. Uh, short comment on Green New Deal. Uh, since we are really ambitious, we have a global Green New Deal for whole planet. We have a Green New Deal for Europe. And we are also planning to make a Green New Deal for local activities as from the small places in your garden to the country. Uh, I would like to invite you on our webpage, which is Green New Deal, GND for Europe.com because we have much more pillars and we could have a, another two hours of discussion. So maybe next time we haven't mentioned uh, fighting inequalities, the job guarantees and many other programs or ideas which we would like to present and we would like to ask you to support or to join us. And, uh, well, the quote, I always like to finish the positive way, so I believe we haven't lost. I have to say thank you for your questions, thank you for your attending, and especially for the panelists and the organizers from the DM25. I believe it was a success, because I see a lot of rebels, leaders, organizations, and if we work together, I believe we can still change it. So thank you so much for coming.